So, as, as mentioned, my talk is on the Book of St. Cyprian, particularly, and it's the subtitle there, An Unknown Treasure in the General Library of the University of Coimbra. So, although I do believe that most people will have some kind of familiarity with this, um, I should still say what, in very broad terms, what is the Book of St. Cyprian. Um, basically, it's what I have here. This is a contemporary edition of the Book of St. Cyprian, published in 2016. Mr. Padre. <laughs> right, right on time. Right, right on time. <laughs> Publicad, uh, published in 2016. And this is essentially a republication of uh, a book of St. Cyprian, quite old, digitalized by the, Nas by the Portuguese National Library. And what the Book of St. Cyprian is, is what usually in, throughout Europe is referred to as a grimoire. Although that attribution might have some nuances to it, for simplification reasons, let's just call it that, a grimoire. And the grimoire is just a magic book, a book containing magical instructions for various purposes. Each grimoire is its own story. And in particular then, the Book of St. Cyprian is largely a collection of folk magic procedures, go on, <laughs> a collection of folk magic procedures focusing on harmful magic and love and domination sorcery. It also contains several other sections on divination, um, astrology, palm reading. It's, it's a, a really just a compilation of a whole lot of, of topics. What's interesting about all of this is that all of these topics, and if we an analyze the content of the book and the language it uses and the topics that, that it brings up, it's very much a publication of the 19th century. And effectively, we don't find references to books of St. Cyprian with this particular content before the 19th century. So this is pretty much a contemporary creation. Now, the point here was to just pass this along, but this has been doing the rounds already. If anybody wants to check out the book, just go ahead. Um, but we do know that, for example, analyzing Inquisition processes, there are references to books of St. Cyprian that don't match the content of the contemporary book of St. Cyprian. But before we go forward, um, we should maybe perhaps explore what the, who is the St. Cyprian that this book refers to? So basically, this refers to St. Cyprian of Antioch. And uh, this, as far as everybody knows, uh, this wasn't an actual historical character. The story of St. Cyprian of Antioch is largely based on three texts, which is the Confession of Cyprian, the, um, the Martyrdom of Cyprian, and the Conversion of Cyprian which are early Christian polemical texts meant to display the superiority of Christianity in face of paganism. The story itself is that Cyprian was a pagan sorcerer who at a certain point tried to cast a, a love spell on a Christian virgin called Justina, was unable to do so because Christianity is implicitly superior to paganism and consequently converts to Christianity and eventually him and Justina are martyred. Now, this story, uh, um, an adaptation of this story, actually got uh, disseminated through uh, inclusion in books such as The Golden Legend, which is a collection of lives of the saints, and it was spread throughout Europe, and it actually became quite popular. Now, throughout Europe now you have this idea of a pagan magician becoming a saint, and even though in his story it is mentioned that Cyprian burned all of his books, you start having books attributed to Cyprian, both in his quality of sorcerer or saint. So maybe some books might have survived, now we have them here attributed to this saint. Another, interest, another important piece of literature is The Prayer of St. Cyprian. Now this is, once again, um, pretty much a widespread phenomenon. I took this one from an Inquisition process. Um, and the prayer of St. Cyprian is, um, you find it all over Europe and even in North Africa and Arabic countries, it's a very popular prayer and extremely long. And it basically is written in the first person as if Cyprian is speaking 
And it basically just lists uh, a whole bunch of evil things that Cyprian would do as a sorcerer. And then lists uh, a, a bunch of Christian powers and names and asks them to undo all of these sorceries that Cyprian used to do. And this prayer is used in um, exorcisms and to banish sorcery and evil spirits and that kind of thing. Now, going back to the book of St. Cyprian, I have done extensive research into this book. And one of the things that always bothered me was when I found references to it in works of ethnographers, such as José Leite Vasconcelos or Teofilo Braga, or even I found folk legends that might mention the book of St. Cyprian, such as those collected by Alexandre Parafita. What these authors and these researchers would uh, describe did not match at all what the book of St. Cyprian contemporarily is. They would mention this book as uh, being used in conjunction with all of three branches used as divination rods, to specifically to find treasure and disenchant it. Uh, also, the book would be frequently used by a priest, and the whole book was meant to be read as a ritual to, to find and disenchant treasure. Now, while the contemporary book of St. Cyprian does have a significant section which is a treasure disenchantment ritual, it is ultimately a very small part of the whole book. So what these people seem to be describing is something completely different than what we have right now. And for a long time, I was willing to disconsider these descriptions. There has always been a certain social and cultural stigma around the book of St. Cyprian. It is taken frequently as a sinful and forbidden object. So it would be likely that the people who would construct these folk narratives and Braga and Vasconcelos being doing their research with these people, they would not be able to find accurate description of the book of St. Cyprian. People would have a general idea of what the book was, but no concrete uh, experience with it. And I held this belief for a very long time until one day I went to the general library of the university here and I wasn't a student at the time. And I found there in the, in the manuscript catalog, manuscript 2559, various prayers to drive away the devil. Now, in the description of this manuscript, um, it mentioned that it contained the, book of, the prayer of St. Cyprian. And I'm okay with that, I collect book, uh, prayers of St. Cyprian. So I requested this book in order to analyze the prayer and compare it with the ones I already have. However, when the book came to me and I started reading it, I very quickly realized that this wasn't <coughs> just a collection of prayers with the prayer of St. Cyprian among them. There was a clear coherence between all the prayers and they all flowed from one into the other as a concise ritual. Also, there were instances of Latin and references to liturgical hymns and psalms, which would indicate that this was supposed to be used by a priest. Furthermore, the whole book kept talking about this enchanting treasure. And at a certain point, it teaches you how to make divination rods to find treasure. So immediately, I realized, well, this isn't really a collection of prayers to drive away the devil. This is a manuscript pre-contemporary book of St. Cyprian that simply nobody knew how to identify. Now, this is, if you're into these topics, of course, this is quite groundbreaking. This is, as far as I know, the only known copy of a pre-contemporary book of St. Cyprian. Something, I'm going to put genuine, quotation marks, a genuine expression of local magic and religion, which has never been analyzed. Nobody ever, no, nobody ever realized that this even existed. So the point here now is to, let's go through, since we have this one example, Let's go through this book and see what effectively constitutes a book of St. Cyprian before they got into the printing press, before the contemporary version got, got created. Oh, you can actually see these, good. Uh, so the book opens up, it's, it's very cool, it has a fold-out page, and it opens up with two crosses on opposing sides of the same page. Now this took me a while to figure out. The first cross is called the Angelic Cross. It's a talisman attributed to St. Thomas Aquinas. 
And it's just a general protection talisman, typically against the lightning. And the second cross, if you look at the letters it has, they're actually the same letters as the St. Benedict Medal. And this spells out an exorcism, Vav Hed or Satanaz, something, something, something. Um, so both crosses are, are protection talismans. You can, of course, debate the protection of what. Um, it could be just protection for the book and the prayer during ritual. It could be a protection for the book of the external world or a protection for the reader of the book. Uh, those are issues that cannot be solved with uh, literary analysis. So, when the book opens with what it calls the first fortification. Uh, and this is very easily identified as a Lorica prayer. Lorica prayers are also a European phenomenon, and they're prayers from a monastic tradition. And they basically go about uh, naming parts of your body and then um, asking the divine power to protect it, like, uh, may my shoulders be protected by the sword of St. Michael, may my chest be protected by the robe of Moses, stuff, stuff like that. It just names your whole body and asks for protection. So the point here is just to create a spiritual protection for whoever is using the book. And in this particular case, it not only asks protection for one individual, it's for a whole group of people. So this is meant for um, a collective use. Then after the protection, the book issues a challenge to the devil. It calls up the devil and uh, um, exhorts him to remove himself and, and other shades and leave the treasure alone. At this point, uh, the book mentions the use of saint relics and the crucifix. Then there is a, an effective treasure disenchantment ritual. Um, this whole ritual mentions uses of holy water and incense, use of Latin liturgical hymns, use of Latin psalms, magical rods, and you start having elements from the prayer of St. Cyprian inserted into it. Now, this is a clear evidence to me, at least, that this ritual is meant to be at least assisted by a priest who would be someone who would have access to liturgical literature and the ability to actually read Latin. Then you have the beginning of the prayer of St. Cyprian, which is just the regular prayer of St. Cyprian, although specifically tailored for treasure disenchantment. While a regular prayer of St. Cyprian would say, um, drive away this disease or this evil spirit, it just says, uh, drive away the, this evil spirit from this treasure. It's specifically designed just for treasure disenchantment. Then it has the second prayer of St. Cyprian, which is just more prayer of St. Cyprian, just kind of a repetition. The conjuration of the same, which I assume is St. Cyprian, and it's just the same thing, same structure as the prayer of St. Cyprian, same type of paragraph, same type of powers being invoked, and then you also have the use uh, of incense. Then we have the exorcism of St. Cyprian. Uh, you start having clear devi deviations from the prayer with insertion, insertions of Latin psalms and other types of exorcism literature. And finally, the conjuration of St. Cyprian, uh, which basically, again, the uh, further deviations from the regular prayer and more Latin. Now, this is the basic structure of the first part of the book. The book has two parts, and all of this um, seems to suggest itself that you're supposed to read all of this in sequence. This is a, a complete ritual for the disenchantment of the treasure. The second part, and I'll admit that potentially both these parts might have uh, uh, different origins, because methodologically speaking they're quite different, but they were written at this point in this manuscript by the same person using the same ink on the same paper. So even if they might have different origins, they were clearly written together and meant to be used together. And the second part is just um, technical details on how to uh, um, perform this original ritual. So that part starts with general disenchantment. And this basically just gives you a set of magical words that you're supposed to say while walking around in a circle to, delimit, to create uh, your ritual space. It then continues with the second disenchantment through herbs, which is instruction on how to create a kind of holy water, although it's not clear if this holy water is the same that's meant to be used on the first part. And this is a, an excerpt from it. Vilotu Orchleto. I don't know what this is. This, I don't, if anybody recognizes this plant, I would appreciate it if somebody told me. Leaves of not grass. 
leaves of ash tree, tepid wort or saladin, salt distal, onions, garlic, rosemary water, all of these boil with border water, it's uncertain translation, and very well spread around the place where one has suspicion that there are treasures and immediately these will be unbound and disenchanted. Then you have preparations for disenchantment. It basically tells you how to use this holy water. It tells you how to draw a circle in which the ritual will happen and with further uses of litanies and psalms. Uh, yeah, and finally, you have a method of making the rods. It's two ways of making divination rods to accurately locate where the treasure is. Now, basically, this then is what a pre-contemporary book of St. Cyprian roughly is. I say roughly because if we only have one example, we can just extrapolate from it, I suppose. Ideally, we, we needed more examples of this type of literature in order to be able to have like a general assessment of what this, what the variability that these books can have. But although we don't have that, we kind of have the second best thing. Um, during my research on the topic of St. Cyprian magic, one of the things I did, oh, by the way, I should have mentioned this earlier. Uh, the very last page of this manuscript has a very faded inscription saying, Josefa Maria from the parish of São Cristóvão do Abassal in Guimarães. Now, Josefa Maria is a female name, and this might have been somebody who might have owned this book at a certain point. This isn't impossible, but it's very unlikely that this was the actual person who wrote it. Although it's obviously not impossible, but finding a woman who would be literate, quite skilled because it's very easy to read, would know Latin and would have a genuine interest in treasure finding, which is a typical male activity in Iberia, is very difficult. So I don't know who that person might be. But we do have a mention, Guimarães, which is a, a town in the north of Portugal. And that, that is a start. So during my research into, into the book of St. Cyprian, I did at one point go up to Guimarães, in particular, to look at the records of Francisco Martins Sarmento. Now this was an early uh, archeologist and ethnographer. And all his manuscripts are held in the Sarmento Society, which is kind of a, a museum. And they're all uh, kind of, uh, we know everything that he actually did, although there are no transcripts from these manuscripts. And I was looking through them, and one of them caught my eye, which was Notebook 37. And this specifically mentions that Sarmento, at a certain point, around Guimarães, which is where he lived, analyzed two books of St. Cyprian. One called The Holy Father, and the other one called Book of King St. Cyprian. Now, I went up there to look at this, and uh, from his description, the book Holy Father and this was me identifying it, is actually a translation of the grimoire of Pope Honorius, which is this book I have here, which is a French grimoire, also with potential elements from the Heptameron, which is another grimoire. So I have both of these here, if anybody would like to take a look. Now, not only is this book a translation of, of this grimoire, it is actually more than that. It is a specific tailoring of the ritual described in the Grimoire of Pope Honorius uh, in order to make it explicitly meant for treasure disenchantment, which is what the Book of St. Cyprian is supposed to be. Now, he doesn't actually mention if this book is manuscript or printed, but I'm, I'm guessing it's kind of manuscript. And independently, this is then a um, tailoring of a foreign grimoire in order to make it fit into the local patterns of what the Book of St. Cyprian would be. So, uh, a, a, not so much a translation as an appropriation of a foreign grimoire. Then, the Book of King St. Cyprian is a similar case, but it's actually a translation of the Grand Grimoire, this grimoire here. Uh, this is a French and Italian grimoire, and the translation is specifically from an Italian version, because he finds untranslated words, and they're Italian. Um, Similarly to the Holy Father, not only is this a translation of the Grand Grimoire, the, the translation also highlights the treasure finding and disenchantment procedures in the Grand Grimoire. The Grand Grimoire already has significant uh, relations to treasure finding, but this translation really highlights them as the only purpose for this Grimoire. However, the Book of King St. Cyprian also contains two parts. 
the, the translation of the Grand Grimoire is the first part. The second one contains alternative uses for, uh, alternative methods for this enchantment, which once again use holy water and divination rods, require priestly assistance, and it also lists uh, a bunch of procedures for curing and driving away evil spirits and, uh, and divination. But what's interesting, it's among these alternative disenchantment methods beyond the Grand Grimoire, one finds this. To disenchant true herbs in the boiling, Voleto or Voleto, Alder, Buckthorn, Leaves of Ash Tree, Rue, so Thistle, Garlic, Rose Water, all boiled in sweet water, again, uncertain translation, Baptize the place where one thinks treasure is, all shall be immediately unbound. This is pretty similar to what we have with manuscript 59, uh, 2559. So, basically, this I'm going to try to take some conclusions from this. What this at least tells us is that apparently in the region of Guimarães, at least, there is, th that manu this manuscript isn't uh, uh, um, a lone instance. There is a literary tradition of similar content around this region of what the treasure finding book is supposed to be. And both manuscripts 2559 and the book of King St. Cyprian clearly insert themselves into. So we can expect that more books of this kind will actually exist, although so far none have been found. In fact, it's, it's hard to even estimate how much of a, of a precious treasure knowing that this book actually exists is. Uh, it's incomprehensible that the finding of an original manuscript book of St. Cyprian wasn't somehow national news. Although that's probably my fault because I'm the one who found it and I didn't call the news. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's basically it. And this, this Grimoire has been sitting here, a, 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 a true literary treasure and cultural treasure of Portugal has been sitting in this library, in this university, for at least 120 years and nobody ever noticed. You did. I did. And that's my presentation. Thank you.